on July 2nd of 1863, thousands of soldiers would fight a bloody battle at arguably one of the most ominous looking places on any battlefield. This is Devil's Den. And we're going to try and figure out just how on earth these two armies just managed to fight on such difficult and rocky terrain. Okay, so we've made our way over to the top, I guess you can say, of Devil's Den. And let's orient ourselves here. So, right here is the Rose Woods. And beyond the Rose Woods is the wheat field. So the wheat field is on the other side of these woods, back in this direction here. Just before us, you have the famed triangular field. Now beyond that, way in the distance, you have Confederate forces of Longstreet's Corps all along here. That is an extension of Seminary Ridge, or also called Warfield Ridge, at least in this area. So when the Confederates would launch their attack, they would come through in this direction here. They would go through the Bushman property, move through the Slider Farm, and General John Bell Hood would be wounded shortly after this attack would take place by a Union artillery shell, rendering one of his arms useless for the rest of his life. So, right off the bat, your command and control is non-existent now. So you had elements moving through that area. Some of the Confederate forces would break off and go up Little Round Top. Some would head this direction. So before us here, you would have the 1st and 3rd Texas of Brigadier General Jerome B. Robertson's brigade. Now the 1st Texas would be advancing through here. The 3rd Arkansas would be advancing into the Rose Woods in this direction here. And for whatever reason, I don't know if it's this clump of trees before us, or if it's the terrain itself, or if it's a little bit of, you know, a fog of war. I don't want to make assumptions because I don't really know the exact answer. You had the 4th and 5th Texas of Robertson's brigade break off and head in this direction. So that left the 1st Texas, which I believe was over strength. They had, uh, I think, 12 companies in their regiment. So they were a pretty big regiment. And they were advancing through right here. Now tasked with defending this area was Brigadier General John Henry Hobart Ward's men. And he would position his men in this general location. Just before us, you would have had the 124th New York. To their right, farther in this direction, you would have had the 86th New York. And farther in this direction, you would have had the 20th Indiana. Now those two regiments, the 86th New York and the 20th Indiana, they were positioned kind of in the Rose Woods here. The 124th New York was positioned just before us here. If you can see through the foliage, you see the statue here. Now the 4th Maine, I'm going to try not to trip. The 4th Maine was positioned back here. You can kind of see the top of their monument here. And providing artillery support was the 4th New York Independent Battery, commanded by Captain James Smith, and he had four 10-pound Parrot rifles. Now it's important to note, the general consensus is this wasn't the location of Smith's Battery. Smith's Battery was located in this general vicinity. And you can see the commanding view that this position holds up until the Confederates are so close that you can't lower your muzzles. But we are going to cover the actions of the 124th New York and learn why the men must see us today. So I'm making my way down from the top of Devil's Den and I'm on an established trail as you can see but this is still very difficult terrain keep in mind i am not under fire i am not exhausted my adrenaline isn't pumping i all my friends are still alive but this is still very difficult you really have to watch where you're stepping here because we are in ankle break central here insane now if you're a little confused as to where we are still here's a pretty good map you have, you can see where we are, you can see where the Union are positioned, you can see where Smith's Battery is, and you can see Robertson's Texans as they were positioned just before us here. You have Evander Law's Alabamians making their way up Big Round Top. And we are in the general vicinity where the 124th New York, also known as the Orange Blossoms, because they were mustered in Orange County, New York, this is their location. This is where they would hold the Confederate forces, at least for a time. And at the top of the statue here, 
you have a man by the name of Augustus Van Horn Ellis. Now he was their commander. And you can see by his pose here, he has his arms crossed, kind of just observing the field. His men constantly stated how calm, cool, and collected he was under fire. And at Gettysburg, it is said that he had this exact pose as the 1st Texas was bearing down on our location here from this area. He was just observing the field and the fighting unfolding as, quote, a farmer observes his crops. That's what I want in an officer. I want an officer who not only leads, but remains calm, which would help steady myself, I think. So we are standing out looking over the triangular field here. And I am right next to the 124th New York Monument, and they were holding this position with a little over 240 men. They were a pretty small regiment at the time, and things were not going well. You had the 1st Texas bearing down on us here. And at a certain point, the Confederates were only about 20 to 30 yards away from this general area. A major by the name of Major James Cronwell saw an opportunity to, to uh, break the Confederate line. He would approach Colonel Augustus Van Horn Ellis and plead with him to counter charge. So let's say that again. He saw an opportunity and he wanted to charge right into the teeth of the 1st Texas, even though the 1st Texas greatly outnumbered the orange blossoms here. Well, Colonel Augustus Van Horn Ellis would deny the first two pleas. And finally, on the third plea, Ellis simply nodded yes. He would look to an orderly and he would instruct that orderly to bring up the horses. Now, if you know anything about Civil War combat, a mounted officer is a prime target. You're up on top of a horse, above the rest of your men, and chances are you may not walk away from that fight. So when Augustus Van Horn Ellis and Major James Cronwell would mount their horses, a nearby captain would plead with them to get down. And Augustus Van Horn Ellis would simply look at the captain and state, the men must see us today. At this moment, this man on this monument decided that his life was worth sacrificing for not only his men, but for the cause in which he believed in. Truly incredible how ordinary people like you and I can decide that it's time to sacrifice your life for a greater cause. I don't know if I can do that. So you can see the statue of the 124th New York in the distance there, and we've made our way down into what is called the Triangular Field. So the 124th New York would have been positioned in this general area, and surging through the Triangular Field here was the 1st Texas. Now remember, you had the 3rd Arkansas in the Rose Woods here, making contact with the 20th Indiana, and the 86th New York. That is some pretty dense woods. It wouldn't have been that dense during the battle, but nonetheless, not conducive for linear warfare. So you have the first Texas making their way up this way. And like we touched on, they were about 20 to 30 yards from the Union lines here before the charge of the 124th New York. Now remember, Smith's guns were right where that monument is before us. And things were getting so desperate for the Union position here that Smith ordered his guns not to be sponged. And what that means is, you have a sponge dipped in water and you would dip that sponge down the barrel of your artillery piece to snuff out any embers. Well, they're skipping that step for the sake of time, which gives them a higher rate of fire. So you can just imagine making the decision to not sponge your guns and you're putting a bag of powder down your barrel, not knowing if there's an ember about to cook off that bag of powder. Now, Augustus Van Horn Ellis would order his men to fix bayonets, and the Orange Blossoms would stand up in unison, let out a cheer, and they would faithfully follow their young colonel down through the Confederate lines here. And they caught the first Texas off guard. They smashed right into their lines. Now, despite this initial success, 
Major James Cromwell would begin celebrating, and a volley from the Texan second rank would drop Major Cromwell. Colonel Augustus Van Hornella, seeing this, desperately sought to rally and refocus his panicked men. You can imagine your major getting struck down by the Confederate volley here. That's pretty demoralizing. So Augustus Van Hornella would ride to the front of the 124th New York, and he said, My God, my God, men, your major's down. Save him, save him. Confederate fire continued to rip through the 124th ranks as they made their way into the triangular field here. Now, Augustus Van Hornelis made his way up to the front, and he would be a prime target for the Confederates. And a single Confederate bullet would rip through Augustus Van Hornelis's head, killing him instantly. And now, you had the two mounted officers, Major James Cronwell and Augustus Van Hornelis, killed in action just before us here. Now, their bodies were recovered by the 124th New York soldiers, but the charge was now losing momentum and they were beginning to break. You had reinforcements coming in from this direction here from the 44th Alabama. So now you have the 1st Texas to your front and the 44th Alabama on your flank. And that was the beginning of the end for the 124th New York's charge. Now they would bring the bodies of Major James Cornwell and Colonel Augustus Van Hornelis back to this location here. So I just wanted to give you another perspective of the charge of the 124th New York. So they would have swept down in this direction here into the triangular field. Now I got my buddy Dustin walking right there. So I just wanted to show you just how much this slopes down because I don't think the camera does it justice. So you can see Dustin making his way up in this general direction. You can just see you're pretty much charging into, I wouldn't say a valley, but I mean you're in a very low point here. Now, one of the things that always sticks out to me covering battlefields is how do ordinary men decide that their life is worth this moment? You know, Augustus Van Hornelis mounts his horse and says, the men must see us today. You know, at that moment, he decided that his life was worth risking or losing in the sake of the cause he believed in or in the sake of inspiring his men and things were that desperate here. I don't know if I can do that. I just keep thinking about that and I like to think that I can step up and lead and you know lead by example but that's not guaranteed like we don't know unless we're in that position and I can't tell you how much I admire those type of actions when you decide that your life is worth that moment and just on this field behind us here Major James Cronwell and Augustus Van Hornellis decided their lives were worth the greater picture that is preserving the Union. Now, Cromwell and Ellis's bodies were recovered and they were brought back to this general area. Now, some historians believe that Ellis's body was placed on this rock here before us, and that is why the monument is placed here. Now, I don't know that for certain. I couldn't really find anything confirming that because I do know there are some historians that also believe that they had no idea which rock it was because as you can see this area is riddled with rocks. But on the chance that Ellis's body was placed here, I just want to do at least pay homage to it here. Can't tell you how much I respect that man's sacrifice and all the other soldiers who laid down their lives here on the Gettysburg battlefields right here on the field before us. So it's important to note that not just the 124th New York was fighting here. You had action all in and around this area here and witnessing that action was this tree here before us. Forever in Devil's Den and you're looking for the witness tree. It's right by Smith's Battery. Right here. Man, if this thing could talk, what it could tell us. Good Lord. And the fact that it's still alive and thriving, despite probably being riddled with lead. It's incredible. Testament to nature. So the 124th New York of the rest of Ward's Brigade would be pushed back from this area. And Confederate sharpshooters 
would occupy Devil's Den here. And we have a little curveball with the fence here, so I can't get any closer, obviously. It is necessary to preserve this for future generations, so it's okay. But you have the famed, probably one of the more famous pictures from the American Civil War of the sharpshooter, who was placed here, by the way. He wasn't killed here. He was placed here, and his photograph was taken right there. Just truly incredible. Now, I don't know if you can see it because it's a bit hazy, but Little Round Top is in the distance. And Confederate sharpshooters wreaked havoc on Union forces on Little Round Top. And it's even suspected that some of their victims were Brigadier General Stephen D. Weed and First Lieutenant Charles Hazlitt, who had a battery on Little Round Top. So you can kind of see it, Little Round Top, in the distance. And all these rocks get you some rocks without the fence were the perfect haven for sharpshooters. Just incredible. And here's just another look at the slaughter pen here. And big round top. Through here you would have had the slider farm again, the Bushman property, so you would have had Confederates advancing all through this area here. So we've made our way back on the other side of Devil's Den. And to reorient you, the 124th New York was positioned on the other side of Devil's Den, kind of in this area here, where you can see some of the Rose Woods. We made our way back over, and here you can see the iconic Little Round Top. Okay, and at the base of Little Round Top, and I guess kind of in between Devil's Den, you have Plum Run, and this area before us here became known as the Slaughter Pen. And I'm about to show you why. Okay, so bear with me here as I try not to trip. So, you had elements of the 4th and 5th Texas. You had some Georgia regiments making their way through this area. A couple Alabama regiments. And they would be coming through this area here. Entering what we call the slaughter pen. Alright, and... As you can see, they are caught in a pretty nasty situation here. So not only can Union forces fire down on them from this location at Devil's Den, they're getting hit with fire from Little Round Top right there. It's a little hazy here, early in the morning here, but just look at the terrain here. Do you think that the Confederates were able to maintain their linear formations here? Absolutely not. It's rough, jagged, bouncing from rock to rock. It's gonna just break up your formations and kind of probably cause a great deal of confusion here on top of you're getting hit from fire from a few sides here, at least until the Union were driven from this location at Devil's Den. But man, you know, it's one thing to see it in pictures and videos, but coming here, you get a really good picture of just how just nasty the terrain is here. I couldn't imagine being a Confederate soldier having to advance through this. And if and when you make it through it, now only part of your attack's done. You have to make your way up Little Round Top here. All right, so let's imagine something real quick. We are a Union soldier and we are tasked with defending this location. We're in the teeth of Devil's Den right now. So imagine. You know, you have Confederates advancing all around us here. Just imagine being in here, shooting your rifle, the echo, the noise, the smoke from the black powder laying low. Like, how do you fight in this? I'm a little out of breath because it's pretty higher than you think, but like, how, how do you manage to fight in this? You know, just moving through. Don't know how they did it. Although Devil's Den is often associated with the famed sharpshooters photo, it is the infantry fight here that cemented its legacy. Nearly 1,800 men were killed, wounded, or captured on these rocks behind us here. And as one soldier would quote, in a hospital nonetheless, awful, awful rocks. Let's head on over to the next one.